Several years ago when uh, my wife and I lived in Wheaton, um, I was a youth pastor at the time, and um, through a, a series of unfortunate events, um, I think the book title is, right? We had this student in my youth group, actually a, a brother and sister, who ended up homeless. Um, it's a long backstory, but became aware of, of the situation. And so um, I was able to find a family in the church who was able to take the, the daughter, um, but we were struggling to find a place for the son to go. And so I had, at the time, my wife and I lived in a two-bedroom home, one bathroom, 900 square feet. It was the two of us, and then I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old uh, little girl who shared a room. Um, but since there was no other option, um, this young man moved into our home for the summer. Um, and I don't know if you've ever had a situation like that, but when you are, have a house full of girls and, and little ones, moving a teenage boy into your home um, disrupts things, right? There's, there's all of a sudden like the amount of food that we had to buy for the week, like tripled, right? Um, things where it's like, okay, we have little ones that go to bed around 7.30, 8 o'clock. Like I would go out at like two in the morning, which our living room was right next to our bedroom, and he'd be out there watching TV. You know, I'd say, you have got to go to bed. You're like all these things that I was totally unprepared for as a parent, totally never experienced before, things in, in terms of how you plan and just like privacy, all of these different things that you were sort of used to in your life. When someone moves in, when you have a house guest, um, things change. By necessity, things change. If you can think back to heading off to college, having your first roommate, right? Learning to live in that situation. Like, I, I was blessed. When I went to Moody, I had a great roommate. We, we were roommates all four years. But there was a, a sort of a tradition at the end of the first semester when freshmen are all looking for different roommates because it didn't work out because they're learning how to live together and to share space. That's a lesson that we learn when we get married to, to two different people with two different backgrounds coming into a shared space and figuring out how do we balance all of this. Um, if you have a situation where you have your, as an adult and your parents are now living back in your home again, all of a sudden it changes your routine changes your lifestyle. If your kid graduates from college and they're still looking for that job and they're back home, the way that you've been operating for the last four years or however long changes. Necessarily, it changes when there is shared space. With that in mind, I, I want us to look back at Romans 8. This is where Pastor Jeff left off last week. And I want us to pick back up here real quick because I, I want us to note something that stood out to me in in these verses. This isn't what, what Jeff was necessarily referring to, but I, I want us just to be aware of this. This is back in Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. He says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So Paul is saying two really important things here to us. Well, he's saying more than that, but for our purposes. He's saying, one, if you are a follower of Jesus, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God dwells in you. But secondly, he's also telling us that that has implications. That, that shared space has implications. If a teenage boy moving into your home changes things, then how much more if the Spirit of God dwells in us? What are the implications of that? If you're new with us this morning, by the way, we are, we are currently in the midst of a sermon series about halfway through focusing on the Holy Spirit, on who he is and what he does and how he works. And, and, and our goal in all of this has been to grow in our understanding of, of who he is and how he works and what he does, but also then our awareness of that, to grow in our awareness of his activity in our lives. And I believe that this is, is vital 
as it relates to the work that God is ultimately going to accomplish through his church, through, through us, through this body of believers. The more we understand, the more that we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the more that we are aware of his leading in our lives, the more that we, we choose to follow him in obedience, the more that we will be effective in achieving our mission. Effective in, in this call to follow Jesus together, effective in, in inviting others into this with us. And this is, this is ultimately what we're here to do. So today, as, as we look at this discussion regarding the spirit who indwells, who is in the life of the Christian, I believe that this is absolutely essential in our effort to follow Jesus. Both collectively, as we effort in this together, but also personally and individually. I also think it's important, or it's worthwhile here, to, to take a moment just to acknowledge just how awkward or foreign this sounds. We, we can sometimes say things in, in a church environment that we're used to saying and hearing. If you grew up in the church or if you've been reading the Bible for some time, perhaps you hear something like the spirit that indwells and it sounds perfectly normal to you. But if, if this is at all new to you, or if you're, still, if you're here and you're still exploring what it means to follow Jesus, what this is all about, why are these people gathering, this, this can sound weird. It sounds like Romans 8 can sound like the plot line of a scary movie, right? It, and it makes us a bit nervous. The idea of something indwelling in us makes us a bit uncomfortable, but I think we're going to discover today that when Paul's writing these words, we're going to look at, we looked in Romans a little bit, we're going to spend the majority of our time in 1 Corinthians. And those who are hearing it for the very first time, I think it made them a bit nervous as well. Especially when Paul uses phrases like, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. So over the course of, of our time together this morning, I hope we can look at what is this, what is Paul talking about? What does he mean when he talks about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and being a temple of the Holy Spirit? And then what are these implications? How does that affect our lives? How are we to understand this? I want to mention here that instead of sort of doing my typical two to three to four points of things that I see in the text, I'm, I'm going to kind of trace one major theme throughout the course of the morning. So I don't have like your prototypical point one, point two, point three. So if you're one of those people who are always looking for these, don't get stressed out. They're not coming, okay? But, but two, I'm borrowing kind of the overarching, um, the overarching narrative of, of this from a sermon that I heard from a guy named Tim Mackey, who, um, if you've ever seen the uh, Bible Project videos um, on YouTube, or we use those in the Intro to the Bible seminar, he's a, a, a pastor and a professor, and I heard him um, give a sermon on this same topic that really, really resonated um, with me, and I want to borrow some of, of his direction here. So let me ask you a question. W what comes to mind for you when you think of the word temple? When I say, when you hear Paul say something like, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, what, what is our understanding or awareness of the idea of a temple? Do you think of something like this, like a, a, a church? Or, or do you think of some building that is used for religious gatherings do you do you think of something from a different religion with all sorts of ornate design and 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 you're not really sure what's going on in there what what is it you think of when you think of a temple see because for most of human history throughout most of the world people were very familiar with the idea of of the temple for instance, when we were studying Ephesians together in the town of Ephesus, and we talked about this, there was a ginormous temple to Artemis that, that stood atop of the city, and it influenced every aspect of, of life and culture. If you look in Acts, there's all these silversmiths that get, that get worked up because Paul is in Ephesus preaching the gospel, and people stop buying their idols, and it causes a riot. So temples in the ancient world were a very common thing. They were in virtually every city around the ancient culture. And everyone was familiar with their role in their society. To, to be sacred, holy place where humanity met with the divine. This is what the ancient culture went to the temple for. 
And of course, if, if you were Jewish, you were very familiar with the idea of the temple. The temple in their mind, Paul says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Think about this for a moment. The temple for them was a physical place in Jerusalem where their people had worshipped, where there had been the center of their life and their faith for over a thousand years. In the same place, in Jerusalem, the place where they met with God. And now Paul says to these followers of Jesus. He says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? See, what Paul's doing something interesting here. And I don't know if you ever experienced this growing up. I grew up in the church. My parents are both uh, followers of Jesus. And and, uh, sometimes when me and my brothers and my friends were running around or whatever, I can still slightly feel the grip of my father's like on my shoulder, right? And he would say, not in church. Not, we don't do this in church. Or if you, if you get like, you think about, sometimes they, they say you put on your Sunday best, right? We come into this place with, with uh, this expectation, this idea, which can be good. But I think sometimes inadvertently what we do in that moment with our kids is we, we separate out the, the sacred and, and everything else, the secular, Right? This is, this is where we walk into this building and you're walking there with these people and this is sacred space. Paul's deconstructing that here. He's saying to these people, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians here. I'm going to start in chapter 3. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now just a little bit of context here. Paul has gone to Corinth, the city of Corinth, on one of his missionary journeys. So this is, he's traveled there, he's, he's taught people about Jesus, people have responded, they've put their faith in Jesus, and he started this church. He was there for about two years before he ultimately, I think, then went next to Ephesus, I believe. And, and when he's away from Corinth for his time, he starts to get reports back that things aren't going well. That there are some pretty significant issues that have emerged in the church. And so Paul's writing this letter that we have as 1 Corinthians. And part of his motivation here is I've, I've got to deal with some of these issues. There's some things that have come up. In chapter 3, which we'll see in just a second, you see one of the issues that emerges here is, is, is division. It's disunity. Which, by the way, there is some degree of not comfort, maybe it's comfort, but have you ever heard people say, like, we got to get back to the early church. We got to get back to the way things were done at the beginning. We paint this picture of like this utopian, perfect society where everybody was just following Jesus and loving each other all the time. But when you read through the New Testament, it's not always that. It's not always the case. It's not always going perfectly. We see Paul now speaking into this because in chapter 3, there's these, these segments that have emerged where people are saying, well, I'm a follower of Paul. And other people who kind of came in after Paul are saying, well, we're a, we're a follower of Apollos. And they're dividing based on sort of who their favorite pastor was. They're, they have this division over which leader they feel like they're going to follow. And there's these personalities and, well, we're about this person. So Paul's writing into this in 1 Corinthians 3, and says, Apollos and I, this is never about us. Like, I planted the seeds. Apollos, he, he watered them. This is about Jesus. This is, he's speaking into this division. And look what he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, Do you not know that you are God's temple, and God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple... God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. See, Paul here is saying this lack of unity that is evident here is is not reconcilable with with the the fact that this group, this is plural, he's saying you, you guys, you are the temple. You followers of Jesus, this group, you are the temple. These two things, they don't belong together we can't have disunity in the temple so paul's calling that out they don't belong together he makes a very similar argument if you flip over to ephesians chapter 2 we we looked in ephesians uh, and read this when we were talking about unity in that passage but a similar issue is emerging in ephesus but this time instead of it being about who are you going to follow it was about it was a racial division 
There was racial prejudice going on in the church. And Paul speaks into that and he says, no. Like this doesn't belong. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So he says, you collectively, this doesn't belong. You are the temple. Racial prejudice can't be in the temple. These two things don't go together. Another example, back in 1 Corinthians. Now in chapter 6, he's going to address another issue here. And the, the city of Corinth, much like the city of Ephesus, was full of, of these pagan temples where people would go to worship. And part of one of the practices here that would often take place is temple prostitution. And so there's these men, Christian men, who are understanding and applying their freedom in Christ, and they're saying sin no longer has a hold on us. We're free because of what Jesus has done. And so their application of that is we can go participate in these pagan worship activities. So Paul is speaking directly into issues of, of sexual immorality and, and abuse and everything that's taking place in there. And he's saying you've You've got it wrong. He's this, this, this false dichotomy of the sacred and the secular. And, and, and so Paul is going to speak into this. This is now 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20. Listen to what he says. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual, sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now Paul says, you, singular in the Greek, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And these two things don't coexist. They don't belong together. Paul uses marriage language here and reminds them that they've been united with Christ and in his body, and their body now is the Holy Spirit's dwelling place. So again, Paul is, is demonstrates this false dichotomy that, that comes up between the sacred and the secular, where they're trying to separate their personal, their recreational activities, and Paul says no. He says you are shared space. You are, you are your life is, your body is sacred Space and these things like disunity and, and racial prejudice and, and, and sexual immorality, these things don't belong together. They can't coexist together because your body is a temple. They don't belong in the temple, and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you, do you have, I have, do you have places where you feel particularly aware of the presence of God? Like for some people, like sometimes corporate worship, right? Is that for people? I hope that is, at least in part, for you when you come into this place. I, I hope that part of what draws you here is, is a sense of, okay, we get to meet with God. And that's an incredible thing. For some people, it is Christian community. It's, it's moments in your small group when you're speaking into each other's life and you're, you're talking about scripture together and you're applying those things. And, and that is like, okay, God is in our midst, right? Some people, it's, it's nature, like you like to get out and be, I, I, just last week, take my Bible and walk out into the forest preserve over there and take my lunch and just eat and read and be in God's creation. And my, my senses, my awareness of his presence there is heightened and I love that. Some of you claim it's the golf course, right? I feel like that is questionable. Um, <laughs> maybe it's a spot in your home that you set aside like a room or a place where you just you go there to meet with God. But those things, those places, this place is not sacred. These people, this is the church. This is where the Holy Spirit is. Our senses, our awareness might increase, but God is not more there than he is somewhere else. He is with us because he dwells in us. 
we become more aware of his presence. What I find so compelling about, about how God is working in this whole idea of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is that this is a, a narrative that we can trace from the very beginning of the story in Genesis all the way through the, the ultimate sort of realization of this in, in heaven and in Revelation. That God wants to be with you. That he wants to be with us. Oftentimes, my first reaction when I hear something like this is like, oh no, right? Like it's like that, that, that kid who's reminded like to be on their best behavior because God sees everything. He's always with you. He's always watching. But I think, and, and again, Paul obviously is addressing some very relevant sin issues in, in the midst of this, for sure. But I think what we miss when that's the only approach that we take to this idea of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is we miss, we miss the pursuit. We miss how much God has run after us to be with us. See, we can track, we can track the story of God dwelling with his people throughout the pages of the Bible. And what we discover is that it's a story of, of pursuit. At the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God creates Adam and Eve, and he dwells with them. God and humanity living in perfect union together. Things are as they were created to be. But then sin enters the picture. They believe the lie that God is withholding something good from them, and they can be like him, and, and Adam and Eve disobey, and as a result, there is there's separation. They're no longer in this perfect union, but God does not abandon humanity in that state. He continues to pursue. Later, when the people of Israel have fled Egypt and they're wandering in the wilderness, God, God gives them instructions to set up a tabernacle, this place where he will dwell with them, where he will be present with them. God's dwelling among his people. It's not the garden, but he hasn't abandoned them. It's his presence with them. Later on, when the people of Israel have entered the promised lands, he gives instructions to Solomon, and he says, I want you to build this temple. And what's so fascinating about all of this, and you look at the, the design and the purpose behind the temple, is that it, it's pointing Israel back to the garden, to the original design, what God intended from the very beginning, but it also points them forward. Like if you read the descriptions of the temple in, in 1 Kings, you'll see all this garden imagery that's embedded in the temple. A reminder of, of how things are intended to be. But in the rituals and in the sacrifice, he's pointing them forward to what Jesus would ultimately accomplish. He's, he's giving them hope about one day they're, they're going to be able to return. See, but this, the problem that emerges is that for the people of Israel, it became, the symbol became the thing. And so we can go to temple and we can, we can offer the sacrifice and we can pray and we do these things and I leave this place, that, that, that sacred space, and I go out into my life and I, I live this completely duplicitous life. So much so that, that God eventually through the prophets, and if you read the prophets in the Old Testament, you'll see this over and over and over again. He says, I don't want your sacrifice. Look at Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. He says, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. You see, the building was intended to remind them of God's pursuing. The point was to first be, as, as Tim Mackey in his sermon describes it, a transforming sharing of space. This is what God wanted for them. But but it became about the temple, not what the temple was meant to provide for them. Despite that, God continues to pursue. Ultimately, then, he sends Jesus. John chapter 1, Gospel of John, verse 14. Listen to this. This is the description of the incarnation. He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He, he dwelt among us. Literally, he tabernacled with us. See, the, the arrival of Jesus is God setting up sacred space to be with his people. 
space to dwell with us. Once again, he invites humanity back into relationship with him. And now the temple's not a building. The temple's flesh and blood. It's a person. For this reason, the Gospel of John in chapter 2, Jesus, one of the very first things that he does in John's recording of, of Jesus' life is he goes into the temple and he clears it. He throws out the money changers. He, he, he deals with all of this corruption and all of this abuse that's present in the temple and the authorities that there say, Who, who's given you, Jesus, the authority to do this? He says in chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise up again. I will raise it up again. You see, Jesus now points to himself as the temple, and it's his death and his resurrection that will validate this. And now Paul speaks to this group of Jesus followers, and he says, you've been united with Christ. And because you've been united with him you are too are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the place where God dwells. You are a walking, breathing example of God's pursuit of humanity. So, so he says to the Corinthians, you're, you're treating your body as private space, as if it belongs to you. But you are not your own. You were bought at a price, so glorify God in your body. So what Paul tells us is that we collectively, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, individually, your life, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are shared space. You're sacred space. See, our God is a God who pursues. Our God is a God who is present with us. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the result of that pursuit. This morning, we have the opportunity to, to respond in worship and respond by, by meeting together and taking communion together. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. And in a moment, um, I'm going to pray for us and our ushers will come and deliver the, the elements of communion to us. And as they do that, um, I just want you to be thinking and processing that reality, that truth, that, that the Holy Spirit indwelling in you is the result of God's pursuit of you. He wants to be present with you because he loves you. Know that today. Be reminded of that today. As you take the cup, as you take the bread, as we celebrate his sacrifice on our behalf. I'm going to pray for us. Our ushers will come and, and hand out the, the bread and the cup. And hold on to those. You'll grab both cups at the same time, and then I will come back and, and guide us through the receiving of, of the elements this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of this building, there are these people. And in the midst of these people, there's you. You're dwelling in us as your church because you love us, because you pursued us. So far as, as being willing to sacrifice yourself on the cross. So Lord, remind us of your presence this morning. Remind us that we are shared space, that our life is sacred space because of what you accomplished on our behalf. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. As Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room, he would take bread and break it. And he said, this bread is my body given for you. As you take this bread, be reminded of his sacrifice. And he took the cup said this cup is my blood it is the blood of a new covenant that has been shed for the forgiveness of sins as you take this cup this morning be reminded of his presence with you take and drink in remembrance of him this morning, uh, instead of just 
offering a traditional benediction, I would, I would like to just pray over you all. I, w- I would like to just pray that your awareness and your experience of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit would be evident, that you would go this week and know that God has pursued you, and if you're a follower of Jesus, he is present with you and that you would live in light of that. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we pray that your Holy Spirit would make his presence so evident in us. Lord, we thank you that that by the gift of your sacrifice, you've made it possible to dwell with us, that we could be in uninhibited relationship with you. So God, today I pray for the lonely. God, I pray that your indwelling Holy Spirit would bring them comfort so that they would know they're never alone. Lord, I I pray for for the hurting. I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring healing in the midst of it. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would walk alongside them, be present with them. Lord, continue to do your work here. Be with us, be in the midst of us, and send us as your church. Amen.